while of course I understand the rhetoric about Vladimir Putin and Russia, we don't want to back him into a corner because this is existential at this point for him. He knows there's no way back. There's no way back into the international community. There's no way back uh, for Russia to be welcomed. Uh, and if that is the case, we're leading uh, him into a very potentially dark path. So we've got to be careful. At the end of the day, this will end in the negotiation. I know that's unpleasant for people to hear, and I'm not talking about appeasement of any kind. Uh, we have to make it clear uh, what the consequences will be if he goes any further. But I'm afraid at this point, we can provide support to Ukraine, but they are going to have to win this fight themselves. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power coming to you on a day in Tbilisi where there is a light mist of snow. And I don't need to tell you, the world is in a strange, strange state right now. And I wanted to talk a bit about it, but what I really wanted to talk about was war propaganda and the effect of war propaganda upon all of us and the responses to that war propaganda end up being more war propaganda. And so I thought I would uh, share with you some ideas that I've had. These are not ideas that I cooked up this morning. These are ideas I've had ever since I've uh, read uh, Jacques Ellul's book on propaganda in the early 1980s. I have never really talked much about war propaganda for the very simple reason that since I've been doing this channel, it hasn't been particularly applicable. And one can always find a conflict in the world. Uh, I don't feel particularly connected to them until... Well, there was September 11th, and then we saw war propaganda then. But we're going to dive deeper into the, the pressure and the psychosis of war propaganda at the present. And let's see what we come up with. One thing I will say is, Chances are I'm going to make you upset, whoever you are, because I'm not on anybody's side. That is to say, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, what we think is good and what you think is bad, because I think things are so complex right now that those sort of simplistic uh, descriptions don't apply anymore. And uh, you'll see why as we go on. Before we do go on, let me just uh, say, you might find this uh, video interesting. And if you do, uh, you can hit the like button, leave a comment. Even if you leave a nasty comment, which I expect a few, maybe, you know. Uh, my The people who watch this channel are generally uh, very thoughtful. But every now and then, uh, you say something that makes people, you know, you hit the propaganda knee-jerk reaction. And again, as I have a whole video on how you can know if you're propagandized, it's when you hit the knee-jerk reaction. If someone says something and you're like, oh, that's wrong, you know, and um, that's a good sign of you having the knee-jerk reaction. If you can eliminate the humanity of the other side and simply stick with your politics, you've got the knee-jerk reaction. And we all have it at different times. I'm not saying I'm above this sort of thing. But if you hit like, the algorithmic deities might choose to send this out into the world a little further. Uh, believe me, my, my reach is really teensy, and I'm grateful for the few people who do find something worth listening to in what I do, because one of the things I am most frightened of is that anything I do turns into propaganda. 
And uh, you will notice that's a running theme on this channel, uh, the idea of propaganda, because I don't think it's them doing anything to us. I think it's us in our social media world doing everything to each other. And to blame the them, whoever they are, you know, whatever, you know, whoever you think is running everything, to blame them on your own problems, mm, not a good thing. And that's when you start stepping into the propaganda puddles. Uh, you can also subscribe. That would be great. And uh, you can, uh, um, I don't know, if you feel like passing on a few shekels my way, if, uh, a little bit of that Randy Cash, a uh, little bit of uh, something to support the channel. I would be much appreciated. And if you provide more than a certain amount, $50 in one go, or um, we'll say $10 a month, then I will provide some audio extras. And so let's go. Let's think about this stuff. Where are we? That's a really good question. In a way, this is a follow-up to the How We Got Here series. And uh, particularly after the 2020 episode, which is circling, but still needs a bit of work, the, the final number 13. Oh, what a lucky number. But we built up a chaotic world around us. Most of us are way too connected, too overly involved with our screens. And the traditional viewpoints in life have largely been overturned. And there are people who want to return to some sort of traditional view. But even those traditional views are largely not very traditional these days. You know, the people who are fighting for you know, whatever from the past, as I would think myself as doing, I recognize that, uh, well, it's not just that we're in new wineskins, but we're in plastic bottles. <laughs> and some of that plastic is leaking into our messages. So things survive in unrecognizable forms, even from 10 years ago, even from... I don't know, 2019, jeepers. We used to talk about, you know, the September 10th people. The September 10th world is kind of gone. And we talk about 2000, September 11th, 2001. But you know what? That still seems quite traditional compared to today. And things were getting quite strange culturally, politically, technologically in 2019. But they still somehow seemed a bit connected to that whole epic that ranged from 1945, after the Second World War, all the way up to the Annus Horribilis 2020. At that point, from 2020 to the present, things have gotten unrecognizable. We are no longer in any sense of the word in that late 20th century, early 21st century bubble. We've hit our World War I moment for the 21st century. Uh, between, between the COVID pandemic, oh, what's that? <laughs> and today's invasion by Russia of Ukraine, it's all gone. I mean, yeah, I can pick up books, I can watch videos, I can listen to music from that period. But that bubble of prosperity, which gradually included more and more people, it just popped. We don't know where we're going. Also, well, let me just say this. We have had propaganda machines turned on. One of my main central points of the How We Got Here series is that we have had propaganda machines turned on ever since World War II. 
And given that the Cold War came after that, we did not turn, we, we lost the keys for turning them off. So we don't know really where we are. Now, I would say that that didn't mean that, for instance, uh, there was a degree of falsity, artificiality, virtuality at the beginning of that period to the degree there is now. I would say there's a ramping up or ramping down of the loss of any sort of tangible reality. But meanwhile, through our globally charged entertainment news media, uh, you know, the, the, uh, even video games, everything has been spiked with propaganda. And not just like one particular propaganda. One thing I need to always, always reiterate is propaganda is not the lies they tell versus the truth we all know. And that's usually how it's framed. You know, they're making propaganda again. Well, they are we. And I am fully aware when I make a video entitled Surviving War Propaganda that this video can be used as propaganda. But you will see, as I go on, I am sticking a radical, uh, I don't know, tire iron into the bicycle wheels <laughs> of this machine. And what I mean by that is I'm not gonna, gonna go down any party lines on this thing. And I've been disturbed by what I have seen, even among people I respected as much as a few months ago, two months ago, talking about, say, the Canadian truckers convoy. Many of those people have suddenly slipped. I mean, it's just like suddenly they all bought the same pill at the same time and took it. Uh, and I'll explain why as we go on. And, uh, you know, we're all hooked up with smartphones. We're all like little insects clicking feelers as we go by saying the sugar's over there, you know, you know, and then came, you know, we, we had this whole COVID thing, which had sparked all sorts of strange reactions and lots of propaganda pro and con. And, um, then came Putin's invasion. All bets are off. Period. So, war propaganda. Uh, let me define it now. I wasn't going to, I was going to save it for later, but let me do it now. War propaganda is often what people think of when they think of propaganda. You know, all those posters of, you know, uh, Nazi youth and uh, the workers of the world uniting and, um, but then again, you know, that American way, you know, posters. But the truth is, every Apple ad, every, you know, bit of commercial uh, product these days is essentially a kind of propaganda. It's a propaganda to get you to buy and to buy and to upgrade your lives, which is why so many people look exactly the same now in the world. That is to say, they, there are slight regional differences but everyone's walking around, scrolling on their phones, swiping left or right. You know, everyone's kind of tapped into constantly communicating with each other. Well, where did that come from? It, it didn't come from the fact that the smartphone is such a beautiful invention. It came from the fact that we are so easily propagandized. And anyone who considers themselves above it, as Jacques Ellul said... The intelligent people think they're above propaganda. They are the most susceptible. I mean, if you're living at the bottom, you know, in a poor country, like in Georgia, just kind of living at the bottom, trying to eat a living, you haven't got time to sit and scroll and do stuff. You know, if you're living on the street, you haven't got, you haven't got the wherewithal to get tons of propaganda. But if you're, you know, got a nice university education. Oh man, you got tons of propaganda coming at you. And again, how do you know? Let's check your knee jerks. What does your knee jerk 
uh, you know, tell you. If what does the name Trump do to you? <laughs> you know, what does the name social justice do to you? What does the phrase LGBT do to you? You know, what does the phrase immigrant do to you? All of these things, you know, you know, what does freedom do to you when you hear it? All of these things, you know, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'm just simply saying what if you hear these kinds of words and you just immediately go like, oh, 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 I got to pay attention. Oh, we got to say something. Oh, you know, then you've been propagandized like we all have. Um, war propaganda, however, now this is the, this is the daily propaganda, the kind that gets you to buy, the kind that gets you to want things, the kind that gets you politically hot under the collar, the kind that gets you, you know, wondering, you know, like, well, yeah, you may say they're conspiracy theories, but they're no theory. If you're one of those kind of people, welcome to the propaganda club. Join us. You're all with us. You're all being propagandized. As Jacques Ellul said, essentially mass media is propaganda because, you know, it's really hard to do propaganda when there's just a small village. Now, you can have social pressure in that, but propaganda is something very different. And if you want more on this, I've talked about this. I've got several videos that deal with this subject directly, particularly the relationship to mass media, the knee-jerk reaction, how television shows will throw in the message, as uh, the critical drinker calls it. Um, and I'll, there's a playlist on my channel. And maybe if, if I remember, I'll put a little strip right here for you to uh, look it up. But war propaganda is a different species altogether. War propaganda ain't nice. War propaganda also can't be kept up forever. But as long as the war is on, I mean, but you'll notice this. You can only go for so long on this fever pitch before you, I mean, I'm sure as many of you like me are already getting like your brain fried. Just like, you know, oh, I wish this would end. Oh, I wish this would end. Which relaxes you just enough to have a little bit more war propaganda. <laughs> That's the thing. But here's the thing. War propaganda. When you think about war propaganda in various wars in the past, you start to get an idea of what we're facing. Now, many of the people I've been listening to uh, for the past few years have all been talking about the, the necessity of freedom of speech. Guess what war propaganda does to the notion of freedom of speech? It... As it moves on the checkmate, let us say right now, America is, you know, has to stand back from the Ukrainian situation. I mean, you know, a lot of bleeding hearts for it, and I'm one of them. But we have to stand back. Why? We know uh, what happens if you indulge. Uh, we know the, the problem. And the problem's going to be, Severe, we'll just say that. But if we enter this situation, war propaganda then ramps up from, right now we're in the to help or not to help, isolationist versus, you know, in our, in our world, globalist situation. But once you cross that line into active conflict, freedom of speech is gone. And... Man, well, this is what a lot of people don't understand right now. They've been on the freedom of speech train, and, and I'm, I'm one of them. I, I believe totally in freedom of speech. But they don't understand wartime reality. You know, during World War II, there were all those posters that said, loose lips sink ships. You know, the, you know watch what you say. Uh... In World War I, you didn't criticize the government whatsoever once it started. What was interesting is in each of those, uh, the World War I, World War II, there was a period at the beginning where, for instance, in America, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't, you know, uh, President Wilson went in saying, I promise you not to send any troops into Europe, you know. Uh, America, even though Roosevelt wanted to help earlier, uh, 
a lot of Americans were saying things like, no, 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 not unless they invade us. All of that talk disappeared as soon as we entered the war. Suddenly to say anything but you're a patriotic American was it. You know, people didn't uh, think about uh, being nice to the, our enemies who were defined as all of those Japanese people, all of those Germans. They were Japs and Krauts. There was no, there was no one, you know, lo lobbying for being nice to everybody. You know, now I'm not saying that was good. I don't think it was. However, there was actually a problem with spying. And there were plenty of German American spies, particularly during World War uh, II. Now, why were they there and more noticeable than the Japanese spies? Because America at that time had a much larger German presence, people who spoke German. And, uh, but even in World War I, those German speaking people were like shedding their Germanness, which is why assimilation became such a thing after World War I, and then especially after World War II, which only broke with the hippie era. So, but yeah, all those people talking about freedom of speech, watch out. And I'm not saying this to be, uh, to be a coward at all. I'm just simply saying, you better not get on your high horse once the ball game changes, if the ball game changes, because you will then be in the wrong place at the wrong time. As Jesus said, to be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. And it's, you know, we've already seen quite a bit of authoritarian leanings. I would call them leanings more than actual fact during this period from our central governments over the virus. And I think that's what the Canadian truckers convoy was about. It's just like, it's too much. You got to stop. Let us breathe again. Because the Canadians had just put so much pressure on everyone to conform. Now, with that fresh in every politician's mind, what do you think is going to happen when suddenly we're at war? Which is why you better be praying, even if you don't believe in God, that we don't enter a war. Because that motive towards free speech, poof, it's going to vanish. And what are you going to do then? And I'm not saying this, like I said, as a coward. I'm saying this as, you know, hey, I'm in Georgia, next door to Russia. They could come over the border any time they get pissed off at us. I'm not a coward because I'm staying here. So I, you know, before someone says that, let me just set you straight. You know, I don't run, but I'm also, I know which side of the bread the butter is on. And I know there's a time for one thing and a time for another. And you'd better figure out what you're going to do. At least have a backup plan when the clamp comes down. And it may. You know, a lot of people are putting their hope in things like Bitcoin and such. I would put my hope in things like friends. You know, places to go. You know, uh, I'm even here as I'm sitting, I, you know, I'm practical minded. I'm going like, well, uh, you know, Lord willing, they're not going to come over the border. But I don't know that. I don't know which way this conflict's going to spread. So, I think to myself, I know someone who lives way on the other end of the country. Yeah, that might be a place to go. Does it mean I can bring my stuff here? I don't know. I'm weighing it. You know, it's just, who knows? I'd like to think everything will just return to normal. Ha! <laughs> You know, get this, this video should just be called, We Are Not Returning to 2019. Period. It's impossible now. You know, no matter what. You know, we could find something better, but, you know, that's a stretch at this moment. One of the things about, 
what what's led us to this point? Well, of course, there's the virus. But let's talk about technology for a second. Geolocation. You ever think about that? Your your smartphone, your computers, even your television. Probably if you have a really good refrigerator that's a smart, which to me means stupid refrigerator. Stupid because the person who bought a smart refrigerator is dumb as a box of rocks. I don't care if you have one or not. You shouldn't. <laughs> you know, all these things are hackable. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, but the point is this. I learned about geolocation the hard way. Um, and this was before I, it wasn't through a computer, it was through my uh, bank card in Alaska. Now I lived in Haines, Alaska, which is 40 miles from the Canadian border, but that's about 400 miles from the nearest town of any size, and that was Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon Territory. Well, it had about, I don't know, 22,000 people living there. But the nice thing about driving up there, beautiful ride. I, I highly recommend if, if life ever permits again, which it will probably at some point, especially up there. They're not shutting anything down in Alaska. Uh, <laughs> I heard something. Well, people would tell me, like, yeah, I don't think you'd be safe in Alaska because the Russians have it in their plan to get Alaska back. And one of the things we're going to mention in this video is Duganism. And I full well believe it. <laughs> but, of course, you know, my response is, you do realize, of course, as you're threatening me that there's no safe place, that the world will be ashes and ruins and radioactivity before anybody ever crosses the extremely rough ocean to come put soldiers in Alaska. You realize that that is impossible. I mean, they could nuke it, but what would be the point of that if you want to get it back? But then again, okay, we'll leave that over there in the realm of science fiction for a while. Um, but no, so I went up to, uh, I, I would often maybe once or twice a year go up to Whitehorse, go to one of their big stores, because for me, going to a big store was like, whoa, look at all this stuff, because we had smaller grocery stores in Haines. And I was in Whitehorse at the Canadian Superstore, where I could find lots of maple syrup and all sorts of uh, things I couldn't find. I could find pierogies there. That was really nice. Can't find them in the grocery stores in Alaska. And uh, I had bought a lot of stuff. I would go up there and stock up. I would I would think more about you know three getting through the winter. I'd go up in o October and have enough stuff for. You know, I, that I could stock my freezer and stock my refrigerator and stock my cabinets with all this stuff and then coast through the winter. So I'd buy several months worth of food at once. <laughs> so I get to the cash register with a really full basket of groceries. And they say, your card's been refused. I had, I had been shopping at uh, this wonderful place, Yukon Sausage, which had all this great German sausage that they would make there. And uh, they also have stuff like reindeer meat and just, you know, Arctic char. And, uh, what is that, <laughs> you might ask. I'll let you look it up. But I then I went to the Canadian Superstore, and then I, my, my card was blocked. And it turns out, I didn't have permission from my bank and the fraud detection agency of my bank to tell them I was going to the Yukon. Now, I remembered the year before I had no problem whatsoever going to Canada and just buying stuff with my card and coming back. There was no problem. And in fact, I, I remember the days when I could do that in Europe as well, you know, uh, but Suddenly, my bank, a very cautious bank, I must say, First National Bank of Alaska, so cautious that in 2008, they didn't have any financial troubles because they didn't make one bad loan. Um, but, no, I realized something then. And, and it's true here in Georgia. I can't be here and using my money without getting permission from my bank to use my card here. And I just went to the Czech Republic to Prague for a few weeks. 
And I had to get permission to use the card, which I turned out I didn't, wasn't able to use for an, a reason almost exactly the same. And that is my card had a, has a chip in it, but the chip isn't the tap chip. And their banks, none of their cash machines will allow me to use it. And so, yeah, did, how did I get by? Fortunately, I had a Georgian card and I put a bunch of money in my Georgian account and that allowed me to get through it. And I came back here and my card worked fine. So why am I talking about geolocation banks? And in fact, right now to, uh, to access my bank in Alaska, I need to use a VPN. I can get money out of the machine, but to actually look at my account, I need a VPN because they will not allow me in from Georgia. And I asked why, and they said it's because too much, you know, bank fraud was coming from here, suspicious stuff from the banks. And I believe it. Well, what that's done is chopped the world up. See, now you're, you're geolocated. I turned off Google for the most part, except for my YouTube account, which I can separate from Google. Because Google, every time I was in a new country, would say, are you sure you're, you're in this country? They would ask me all these questions. Now, what that's done is created a world where we are divided up, but also where tech knows where you are at all times. I mean, even though I stopped using Google, I am sure I am geolocated. Geolocation also, you know, one of the things people do with VPNs, virtual private network, which means I can go into, uh, you know, I can, I can say I am actually in America and go into, uh, my bank and they go like, Oh, great. You're in America. Although I went to, I can't remember which site it was. And they said, why are you, uh, you know, you're using a VPN. We won't allow it. So some places are even getting wiser to that. Um, I mean, can I, can I pretend to be in China or Russia right now? I don't know. I haven't tried it. But the point is, is that the VPNs are, are, are an admission. For instance, there's a network, uh, sorry, a Netflix in so many different countries, but you can't access the Netflix from different countries from your country. So, you have to pretend to be in that country to use their country. Or BBC is famous for this. They won't let people who aren't in Britain watch so much BBC content. But if you're in, uh, if you're in, quote unquote, in the UK through a uh, VPN, you can then watch all you want. I mean, if you want to watch, uh, go on to a jar net here, pretend to be from Georgia, and you'll get a, all the content you want for free. What did you just say, Bern? <laughs> uh, it's, it, I feel like we're outside the, uh, the, the system in some ways here. But that has created, this is what's happening. We're, you know, at one point there was this whole dream about the internet bringing all the world together, about, you know, the computer and email and all this stuff. And you know what's happening? Just the opposite, especially with social media. Social media has, uh, essentially created, well, we use the word echo chambers, you know. Now, there is still mainstream media. There are still the, you know, CNNs and the MSNBCs and uh, Fox and uh, New York Times and the BBC and uh, all of these different services. But right now we're in a situation where there's the mainstream and social media. Now, social media can obviously take many different forms. The, the vast majority of the mainstream media, except for places like Fox, sometimes Wall Street Journal, are, are more right-leaning. But even they are all kind of focused on the same issues. They're using the same clips, often from social media. And they are, you know, they're, they've been relentless throughout the uh, pandemic. But before that, uh, so many of these places have been relentless on the anti-Trump train, you know, they and spreading the whole like Russia conspiracy thing. And this is before there was any sort of war, you know, spreading all of this stuff. Uh, you know, it's all, you know, people say, follow the science. Well, and if you actually 
keep track of what they're saying. The science is changing. The science is changing all the time. Something you weren't allowed to say, maybe this came from a lab in Wuhan. Later, you could. I mean, I'm talking on, on you know, YouTube or Twitter. You get uh, censored for saying these kinds of things. This is, and, and besides the mainstream media, there is the effect of the large tech organizations. So there's Google and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube uh, and Instagram, which are YouTube, Instagram, and, and Facebook all connected. No, wait. YouTube and Google are connected. Facebook and Instagram are connected. But you get the general point. And other, other kinds of uh, media. But the point is these platforms then started to act more like editors and publishers saying, oh, we can't allow you to say this. So all sorts of alternative versions of this stuff, Telegram and Odyssey and, uh, you know, Parler for a while until that got shut down after January 6th of 2021, um, and uh, Minds.com and on and on and on. There's all these alternative platforms. No one of them has grabbed that much attention yet. But the point is, is we're living in this stew of competing ideas. And frankly, uh, like I've come here and nobody in Prague, for instance, ever heard about the Canadian truckers convoy. Why? <laughs> well, I know why. They made sure they didn't cover it on the news. <laughs> you know, that's why. Uh, you know, it's like if someone was telling me, you know, there's a lot of mask mandate hysteria, both pro and con. But if someone was telling me all about how to stay healthy with masks and and all this other stuff, it was clear to me, okay, you're watching, uh, you know, CNN and you're watching NBC and you're watching, reading the New York Times or the New Yorker or somebody, you know, who are pumping out this one particular message over and over again. And any alternative was labeled as fake news. Now, there is genuine fake news. And there's also genuine discrepancies in real news, which, of course, is going to become a real problem for uh, what where we are now. You know what? I think this video is going to go on for a while. So, <laughs> go, get, go get a snack. <laughs> this is a good place to stop because it's going to get thicker. Uh, years of mainstream media have essentially cre created this propaganda war over such subjects as Brexit, the gilets jaunes in France, the yellow vests, uh, Trump's presidency, uh, the whispers of a cold civil war, which the media me uh, originally said, eh, no such thing. Then they started saying, oh, this looks real. Y years after the people who had actually been talking about it, had been talking about it. Another one of those situations. Um, and then came 2020. Then came the pandemic. And the George Floyd protests and riots. And it was the and riots part. That, you know, Famously, there was the guy standing in front of a burning building saying, these protests have been mostly peaceful as the burn building is burning down behind him. Uh, and nearly 30 people died during those protests. And it, it was like a mania that swept the world, you know. And protest is good when it's for a good cause. And, and I think not being racist is, is certainly a good cause. But it was the mania of it. It was the ideology of Black Lives Matter uh, that was really a problem. And the mainstream media just, you know, sliced off you know, bits of the Black Lives Matter uh, vegan sausage and just served it up and said, this is the only truth. They're not saying that anymore, by the way. <laughs> it's interesting. And it, recently, Facebook, who had been banning anyone for criticizing uh, certain aspects of those protests or riots, uh, has recently come out and said, we're totally against hate speech, except when applied to you, you know, we're going to make some exceptions. We realize things are hot related to the Russians. So, yeah, it's okay to hate Russians now. Such is life, you know, and this is propaganda as well. Um, and, of course, then there was the divisive 2020 elections, which I'm not going to discuss here. Wait for my 2020 video. 
And then there's the January 16th bum rush of the Capitol, and it really was a bum rush. It wasn't an insurrection. And nobody has found the conspirators. It was more a bunch of really stupid people believing conspiracy theories. Some, some people just kind of going on, going, where are we going? Capitol, great. You know, but it wasn't like people were sitting there going, we're taking over. And even when they got in, they did nothing. They, they were just stupid. You know, someone took Nancy Pelosi's podium. My gosh, you could start a revolution with that. So, you know, uh, did I say January 16th? I meant 6th, of course. Um, and then there's the twilight zone we entered when Biden became president. It's like nothing changed except it just all seemed weird. And like, you know, someone actually, when I was in Prague, someone said, we didn't even realize he was president. <laughs> we just forgot about him entirely. All we knew is he wasn't Trump, which I thought was perfect. That's Biden's presidency. All we know is he's not Trump. Um, the fact that he falls asleep and can't get a sentence straight, yeah, well, that doesn't matter, does it? Not when you're armed against someone as wily as Putin. Doesn't matter at all. And, and then, of course, there was that whole thing with, uh, well, no, I'll maybe mention that later. Uh, and I think the signal to folks in Russia, particular one president in Russia, was our really dismally handled Afghanistan withdrawal. I mean, we left American people behind, and we left billions of dollars of very high-tech equipment behind. Hmm. I wonder what that told the rest of the world. You know. Um, and then there was all the stuff, endless mask uh, and vaccine mandates and arguments over that. Uh, then there was Justin Trudeau and Canada's overreaction to the, uh, well, to everything really in terms of just keeping Canada, Canada locked down like they were a refrigerator that, you know, we need to keep the kids from raiding. And then the convoy of Canadian truckers came there, took over Ottawa, but were very peaceful. Someone saw someone with a, uh, you know, I guess, uh, Confederate flag or someone else with a Nazi flag, and they thought, it's all Nazis. Uh, and that's what the media does. They look for one example, blow it up into the entirety, and they're getting worse at it, in a sense. Um, but, you know, all of this stuff is just percolating. So we were in the midst of what I'd call serious Cold War propaganda already. And it wasn't even against Russia, it, although, you know, some of it was. And then came Putin's invasion. <clears throat> it's interesting to me that there was has been a polarity switch. And what do I mean? I mean, if you go back to 2001 and September 11th, and then you look at the people who were protesting any sort of war then, who are protesting the Afghanistan invasion, who are protesting later the Iraq invasion, they were mostly left-wingers. And the right wing was saying, we got to go in there. Now, the polls have switched. Not everyone, but a lot of people. So now, it's people who had been on the right or anti-woke who are largely saying things like, no, no, we don't want to fight. We don't want to get into this. Plus, it's going to be really dangerous, which it would be for the whole world. But, and it's more the mainstream media, which is kind of pushing this, well, we might have to do something. We might have to go in there. Uh, and, you know, every now and then you hear someone toying with the no-fly zone idea, which we'll discuss in just a moment. So... One of the big issues is where do we get our news from? Because I really do not trust most mainstream sources. Just just on pure aesthetics alone, the way they chop stuff up. You know, they they have we need some filler to f fill in this to show you know, and they'll cut, okay we we got this from another source. We'll put that in there, and it's cut and paste. It's a mosaic. It's collage. So 
Where do we get our sources from? I'm going to deal with this a little bit more later, a lot more later, actually. Because that is the whole point of this, is how do we survive the onslaught of war propaganda? But what is going on in Ukraine? Here are the what I would consider the undeniable facts. Now, I'm sure there will be people, because here's one thing I've come to learn. There are people... No matter what you believe, or what you think, or what we can pretty much prove throughout history, there is always someone who will say, that's bullshit, that never happened. That's bullshit, that's not what's going on. But what I'm giving you here is what I consider to be, with the, ex with the big exception that the Russian government is saying, this is not a war, this is a special operation. These are the facts that we see right now. And this is what's important. These are the undeniable things. Cities are being crushed and leveled. I mean, I have heard a few really remarkably stupid people who think the Ukrainians are doing this to themselves, but they obviously are not sharing a brain between themselves. Russian troops have invaded Ukraine. No, it's not a special operation. They're going for the capital. Ukrainian forces are fighting back. And they really are. And they're doing a great job. I mean, if I was there, I would be fighting back too. Uh, many, I, I, when I wrote this a couple days ago, I wrote the word hundreds. Now I'm saying this. Thousands of people are dying. There are at present two and a half, well, I wrote this, two and a half million Ukrainian refugees, by the time you watch this, the number will be higher. And most of the, uh, 1.5 million of these have gone to um, Poland. And being part Ukrainian, part Polish myself, I understand why. You know, they're close in temperament and they also have both experienced some of the darkest aspects of human history in the 20th century. So, um, and here's the other thing. If NATO and America get involved, it could lead to World War III. Those are the things we know. Everything else, why, what's going on, you know, who's who, what do they actually believe, these are the things that propaganda will be chewing over for your benefit. As of, just to give you a bit, now this was as of March 9th. The UN says that as of March 9th, Poland had taken in, uh, we'll just change this now, I had 1,400, uh, one, one mil, sorry, 1, 400, 000, 1, 000. Uh, Hungary has taken in over 200,000. Slovakia over, uh, uh over 150,000, 165,000. Romania has taken 84, thousand people. Russia itself has taken in refugees, probably the more of the pro-Russian people from the east, but uh, nevertheless, they've taken in 95 plus thousand people. Uh, Moldova has taken in 82,000 people, we'll say 83,000 by now. Uh, Belarus has taken in uh, a chunk of people, uh, less than a thousand according to this Meanwhile, more than 255,000 as of this have gone to other European countries. That is just by this, and, and it's gone up. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if by the time you watch this, it's 3 million people have fled. And then let me point this out. Some people I've heard saying, we seem to care about this more than the Syrian crisis. We seem to care about this more than Afghanistan. There is a reason. And the reason is, is because in the West and other places, there are an awful lot of Ukrainians living there already. And relatively few before the, uh, before the Syrian civil war, relatively few Syrians. I mean, if you do the statistics in America, it's very different. So Ukraine, according to this statistic, has 37 and, a, and 37 and a half million people. 
Now, I've also read that they have 43 million people. Uh, oh, well, you know, the truth is, this is just Ukrainians. So there are probably 43 million people, because there's a whole lot of other people of different ethnicities, and Russians, who live in Ukraine. So, yeah, that makes sense. The biggest, the place that has the most Ukrainians after Ukraine, there are over 3 million Ukrainians in Russia. So now you can see this is getting really complicated. Next, Canada has 1,359,000, we'll stop there, million people. 59,000, 1,359,000 people. That's one-fourth of the Canadian population. Sorry, not one-fourth, 4%. So, and it is one of the biggest uh social ethnic groups after you know the usual white anglo-saxon stuff in canada and they maintain their U ukrainian heritage particularly in manitoba uh poland has 1,200,000 ukrainians that's prior to this uh united states has over a million ukrainians Brazil has 600,000 Ukrainians. Moldova, very small town, uh, country, which is divided, half of it, the trans uh folks, are considered themselves Russia, and they're just waiting for the Russian army to connect to them uh, on the other side of Odessa. But, of course, before that happens, there will be a large war for Odessa. Uh, Kazakhstan has, uh, Moldova has f almost 450,000 people. Kazakhstan has 338,000. Um, Argentina has 300,000. Germany has, uh, 272,000. Um, the Czech Republic has 131,000 people. And what you have to understand is, I believe after Slovakia, and Slovakians, the Ukrainians are the largest majority in uh, minority in the Czech Republic. Some of you may know it as Czechia, but I just can't get that word out of my mouth. Uh, France, 200,000 people. Italy, uh, 230,000 uh, Ukrainians. Belarus, 159,000. Uh, Spain, over 100,000. Romania, 50,000. Portugal, 45,000. You get the point. We are intimately uh, connected to Ukraine in a way in which we were never intimately uh, connected to Syria, Iraq, or Afghanistan, or Somalia, or Eritrea. And that is why this is a big deal. Plus, this is the dividing line. This can lead, you know, the war in Syria isn't going to lead to a bigger conflagration. The war in Ukraine easily can. Do you, do you get the picture yet? This is really complicated. You know, I am four parts. Norwegian, Scottish, I don't know how they get along. But actually, they historically, they did. Uh, but then Ukrainian and Polish. So I feel it. I've been to Poland. I've never been to Ukraine. and But I feel it. You know, it's just like, uh, yeah. So, let's talk about propagandas. Is this going on too long for you? Take a break. Turn it off for a moment. Moment. Go use the uh, facilities. Do what you got to do. I'll wait. I'll be here. You know, just hit the button and pause it. So, let's talk about different kinds of propagandas and the way they're shaping up. And I'm going to just read these things. Propaganda as the Minister for Communications, Joseph Goebbels, once said, always has to be based on truth, on fact. You'll hear things that you go, like, well, that's true. You know, and you should probably hear them in every one of these types of propaganda I hear. Someone's going to, and at the same time, you're going to hear things that make you go like, oh, no, no, I, yeah, and your knee's going to jerk and hit you in the face. So, Western mainstream propaganda, which is the kind of thing pumped out by the majority of the large news outlets and kind of what's behind a lot of the big tech, is pumping out the following kind of propaganda. Something must be done. 
This is horrible. Ukrainians are being slaughtered. No fly zones. No, no, but, but. What about the oil production? Prices are going up. Inflation. Our inflation is war related. Don't you see? Do not tempt us into war. It won't end well. Russia is bad, bad, bad. Speech must be contained, especially Russian disinformation. And when I say Russia is bad, 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 what's implied behind that is all Russians are problematic. I'm wondering if we're going to see what we saw during the September 11th crisis and the wars in the Middle East after that, a real concentrated effort to look at the Russians the way we, you know, we didn't want to be Islamophobic. So we, we bent over backwards as, as a country, as nations to say, no, not all Islamic people are like the terrorists. We bent over backwards to do that, which ended up by 2020 creating Islam and Islamic people as a separate race uh, and a separate undiscussable category. That you were a racist if you had any kinds of problems with Islam, even as a religion, even as uh, political doctrines, even if you just came out and said that sort of thing. Will the same grace be applied to the Russians? Somehow, I doubt it. Uh, and again, hate speech is terrible, unless it's against the Russians. <laughs> and cool heads must prevail. Now again, these are many of the things I've seen on the mainstream media just being pumped out. I'm not saying whether they're true or not. I'm just, and it's the same with all of these. The Russian propaganda goes like this. Ukraine is an illegitimate country carved off by carve up. Let's try this again. Ukraine is an illegitimate country carved off of Russia by a mongrel Slavic people from the defunct Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they are natural fascists. In fact, many of them joined fascist movements in World War II when Hitler's troops came through. There is no war. This is a limited special intervention, special operation to denazify Ukraine. We need to denazify Ukraine and we have proof that there are Nazis in Ukraine. Proof for this is found in groups like the Azov Battalion, in the separatist regions, Ukraine backs these groups. The illegitimate Ukrainians are in fact puppets of the Western NATO powers who want to destroy Russia. Proof for this can be seen in the way America, Europe, the West treated Russia after the Cold War. Russia is the victim here. But Russia is still strong. Putin has restored our pride, which was destroyed by the West. We will do whatever we need to save our country from the destruction of the West and to prove our pride, to prove our Russian soul. The, the holy Russian Eurasian Empire must be restored. God is with us and the holy Orthodox Russian Church, Russian Orthodox Church. And the West is completely decadent and anti-Christian. Talking about switched polarities, <laughs> how did Russia end up as the Christians and the West as the decadent folk? And you know what? If you're honest, we kind of are. I mean, just look at our music for the last 15, 20 years. I mean, look at it since the hippie era and look at it from a Russian perspective. Um, 
Again, I'm just telling you what the propaganda is. I'm not trying to interpret this. Because I know better than to wade into interpreting this. And in fact, some people will already be like sitting there going like, yeah, but you forgot this. It's not me forgetting anything. I'm just telling you their propaganda. Here's Ukrainian propaganda. We are victims. We have been terribly victimized through history, especially in the 20th century. The Russians and the Soviet Union were responsible for much of it, as were the Nazis and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We are not fascists. Ukraine is different than Russia. Though most of us speak Russian as well as Ukrainian, we want to be a part of the West and have a chance to economically prosper like the Poles. Yes, there are fascists in the extreme East, but we needed them to use them against the fascist Russian invaders. We are brave. We will fight to the death. We will not let the Russians win. Zelensky is a hero. And the title of our great national anthem is Ukraine Has Not Yet Perished. European propaganda. Oh no, not again. Europe is united right now, even Poland and Hungary, which they kind of are. Russia is the enemy, but we are connected to them economically. We are very afraid of World War III. Russia will continue on into Europe. The people from the east, in the eastern edge of uh, Europe, say things like, we have seen this before, but can anyone please help us before this spreads? America, are you there? Russia, will you please be peaceful before it's too late? If worse comes to worse, we are united. Please stop, though. That's European propaganda. Woke propaganda. Black lives still matter. Trans lives still matter. Women cannot be determined through biology. Gender is imagistically defined. Russia is evil because they are against LGBT issues. Russians are all suspect because most of them are racist and anti-LGBT. Do not forget what really matters, the new world where everything will become perfect. And the Russians probably need to be psychologically changed or even eliminated. And maybe this is all about oil. Anti-woke propaganda. We watch the media lie to us about COVID, Trump, wokeness, and Russian infiltration for years. How can we trust anything, they say? Therefore, what are we even watching on the news? Is any of it true? Yes, Ukrainians are suffering, but Russians are people too. We should not get into a war that may lead to World War III. Yes, Russia is bad, but... Maybe they are being smeared by the media the way they have smeared far too many people in the last five years. Don't stop exposing governments, uh, the government's authoritarian lies. Ukraine is being invaded. It may be horrible, but don't fall for emotional pleas to drag us into war. Free speech is still the most crucial thing, and by banning Russian disinformation, you're preventing us from understanding what is going on. Inflation started with Biden. And the oil prices were rising before Putin invaded. This is Biden's fault. And how much of this is about oil production? And who is fighting who? We don't even know how many Ukrainians are fascists. American right-wing extremists. And here, these can be very contradictory to each other because there are different kinds of really right-wing extremists. And contrary to popular CNN, NBC, Times, etc. opinion, the anti-woke folks are not extreme rightists. They tend to be uh, centrist. Uh, they tend to be uh, liberalish. Leftish, rightish, in this middle. 
They just don't like all the woke stuff. But on the American, the American right wing is saying a variety of things, including Russians. We knew it. Or the only good Russian is, shall we say, no longer breathing. We've got a ton of weapons. Let's wipe the floor with them. We don't care about fighting this war, but if they take a step on American soil, which they can't, they're dead. Also, Russians are fighting for European traditions, which the postmodern West has stomped all over. Ukraine represents the liberal West and should be wiped from existence. Long live Russia and our Christian European culture. Now, obviously, that last bunch is different from the first bunch, but those are all more extreme American right-wing opinions. Let's deal with a few of these propaganda assumptions. I'm not going to deal with them in depth, but just to point out some of the obvious contradictions in them. And the reason, I mean, the reason I'm not going further is because uh, this video is getting too long. And, uh, you know, I'll think about whatever I do. I don't want to make a lot of videos about what's going on over there. I've got a lot of other stuff I want to do, and I think we should continue with these kinds of, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand history and art and meaning and life and truth. Because none of it matters if we don't understand these things. But let me give you some, a little of my understanding to look behind the mask of some of these presuppositions. And one of the biggest issues and this is coming from Russian propaganda, uh, but it also deals with the nature of Ukraine as a country. But somehow it's infiltrated its way, certainly into the uh, extreme uh, racialist right, which is probably a very small number in America. But it's also um, kind of taken off in the anti-woke group because they don't trust anything they see in the media. And that is the idea that Ukraine is filled with fascists and is probably run by fascists. Now, let me just say this. Ukraine is not a sweetheart country. Ukraine has plenty of corruption. Zelensky has Vladimir Zelensky has shown himself to have some of the same kinds of problems Putin does. That is to say, they have restricted free speech. Uh, he hasn't gotten as far uh, as Putin, but he's not an unqualified hero. Um, but I don't think he, being a Jewish man, is a racialist, a racist Nazi. You know, uh, that's obvious. And yet, the way people are dealing with this now is that it's not obvious. And I've, I've just seen things that have disturbed me coming from people I used to think had their brain screwed on. I think they did have their brain screwed on when it came to the kind of media manipulation we've been seeing in, a, in the last few years uh, that really is got its authoritarian teeth at times. But here's the point. When these people stepped over into international politics, let's just say their presuppositions were showing. And here's one of the, here's one of the most important things to understand about propaganda. Propaganda is never by itself. The reason that I'm not a propagandist is because I don't represent anybody. I don't speak for anybody apart from whoever, human beings, you know, and I don't have any particular, you know, system. If I did, I would be worried if people started to all adopt it and didn't question it. But what propaganda does is when a new event happens, uh, and I noticed this with the virus, people were, you know, on this side of Trump and that side of Trump, and the virus comes and suddenly... They're on this side of the virus and on that side of the virus. And the war comes and they're on this side of the war and that side of the war. 
instantly. Propaganda adopts to uh, ad adapts rather, I should say. The it adapts whatever comes along and squeezes it, pushes it, puts it on its procrustean bed and chops its legs off to fit it into the already established narratives. And this is what makes propaganda so dangerous is because eventually, as, as is being shown by uh, not everyone, there's certainly people I trust who are speaking who are not uh, simply in the woke monolith. But most of these people don't have any idea of what life is like in Eastern Europe. That is to say, they, they have only the, you know, at best the holiday understanding of being there for a little bit and coming back. They do not have the deeper level history of the region, which is important. So one of the things you keep hearing is that Ukrainian, you know, the Ukrainians are fascist and they were fascist during World War II. True. Some Ukrainians joined up with the Nazis because they thought the Nazis were there to liberate them from guess who? The Soviet Union. They had, they had already been through the Great Famine. They had, they had already experienced a lot. So they, they stupidly, blindly put their trust in the Nazis and they adopted some of their ideology. And then most of them got slaughtered off by the same Nazis because the Nazis really had a view of, of uh, Ukrainians as being lower than human because they were Slavs. So what, what now there is a group called the Azov Battalion who at last count I heard numbered about 3,000 people, 3,000 troops who are in the no man's land, the road warrior zone of these eastern provinces up against the Russians. And some people say, well, it's the Russian separatists. Yeah, some. But believe me, it's the Russians. It is the Russians. Like, for instance, when Crimea was invaded, they said it was the people rising up. And we saw all these what are called the little green men with uh, uniforms that had no insignias or anything on them. Turned out later, as we suspected, they were all just Russian troops without, you know, proper identification. Same thing happened in Luhansk and uh, Donetsk. By the way, Luhansk is sometimes called Lugansk. I don't know which one's Russian and which one's Georgian off the top of my head. And a lot of people are going on and on about Kiev versus Kiev. But you know what? They're both the same country. And when and people are now saying, well, we need to call it... Well, I guess what they're saying is Kiev is more the Ukrainian pronunciation. But let me tell you, a lot of the people who lived in, you know, Kiev were also Russian. A lot of people on the eastern half of, of uh, Ukraine uh, spoke perfect Russian. You know, they, you couldn't tell them apart from the Russians. And even the Ukrainians who speak Ukrainian, which is a real language and separate, are more from the West, but they all speak Russian, unless they're politically opposed to doing so, which they might be in some cases. But the idea has gone around, and you can see people who are absolutely dense in their history making a connection between what happened in World War II and the Ukrainian, uh, the, these are really genuinely Nazi people over in the East, these 3,000 members strong of the Azov Battalion. There is no connection because, do you know how long that was ago? You have to keep up this idea that there were secret people all along who were fascists. There's no one hardly alive left from World War II. You know, like I said... And Hitler did a great job of slaughtering off most of these people, which probably did not leave a good taste in their mouth. They felt betrayed from both sides. And they, I think they realized their stupidity. <laughs> you know. Now here's the weird part. Okay, so by the way, I'll grant that the Azov Battalion, which was formed during 2014, 
out of the members of a football club, <laughs> of all things. But then again, if you know football hooliganism, it isn't hard to believe. These folks, yeah, they they had uh, extremist elements to them, and then these Nazi guys came in and kind of blended with them. And there are videos you can find where all these people have weird flags. They have the black sun flag. They have, you know, uh, variations on the Nazi flag and all of this other stuff. Granted, and that's not good at all. That This is bad news. However, let's say there are 5,000 of these people. Not 3,000, but let's up the number to 5,000. That is only... 0.01162 blah 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 percent of 43 million. Do you get what I'm saying? If you were to put the same measure against America, take all the the, the truly alt-right, uh, truly racist people in America, what do you think our numbers would be? They're small too. But I bet they're a little higher than that, maybe. Maybe. We don't know. I haven't ever done that research. But the point is this. They haven't taken over the Soviet Union. I mean, sorry. <laughs> Fraudulent slip there. They haven't taken over the uh, Ukraine. Who has taken over Ukraine has been quite a bit of the oligarchs, uh, the Ukrainian or uh, slash Russian mafia, all of this stuff. Plenty of corruption in Ukraine. They are not an ideal country. However, most of the people in this country are just kind of salt of the earth people who just have to live. They're being slaughtered off. And keep this in mind. There is a philosopher called Alexander Dugan. And he has a philosophy called Eurasianism or Neo-Eurasianism where he believes that the Russians are a separate race, that because they have this mixture of European and Asian blood, Mongolian blood, they look at the world very differently. They're not Europeans. And Putin has been really influenced by this. Now, one thing we have to point out, however, is that uh, Dugan started this thing called... <laughs> Let's see if I can get this correctly... Uh, the Bolshevik Socialist Movement. Did you hear what I... No. Uh, no. Bolshevik Nationalist Movement. Yeah. Something like that. I'll put a flag of, of theirs on the wall and, and make sure I get it correctly. But the point is this. Guess what that movement was? Fascist. Now, he then backed off. Now, these groups, uh, and there was a lot of them in Russia that uh, started after the Cold War. I guess they'd been listening to too much death metal or something. And so what happens is these groups start going the, instead of the Nordic pagan route, like what was happening in Norway and Sweden, they were going the, uh, shall we say, the, uh, the Slavic pagan route. And in fact, the Azov Battalion does not claim to be Christian. They claim to be Slavic pagans. And this is pagans in the much older sense of the word, like they used to be in the past when they sacrificed people and killed people. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go into a full description of them because I'm no expert on the subject. And uh, this is me after talking about it, after kind of getting up to speed. Uh, I first heard of him in 2017 by this guy. I don't know his name. He's a Romanian guy. Kind of a wise-cracking, wry interpreter of things and uh, certainly remembers uh, Romania after, uh, you know, during the Soviet uh, communist era. But he's he has a video, which I'll link here, which I listened to when it first came out in 2017, I believe it was, called What is Duganism? And Why It Matters. And I'm going to link that here. And here's the point. This is the philosophical underworkings of Putin. One of the things that happened, and he points this out very clearly, in it, when Dugan's ideas first came out, as they, they were declared a heresy by the Russian Orthodox Church. But this was near the beginning of the 
the aughts, at the beginning of the 21st century. Later, they were, uh, many of these people were older, who the patriarchs were older, who declared uh, this to be a heresy, and they've all pretty much died off since then. Which means, because uh, the, the older uh, you know, uh, patriarchs in the various Orthodox churches tend to be actually older men. So, the younger ones, however, started to believe. And what he started to do was to mix. He, he stepped away from the pagan aspects, which were there in the beginning, in the 90s. And he started to mix the Russian Orthodox Church uh, template into it. And so got it very confused. Now, my own thought seems to be that most Russians don't have any idea about this stuff. That is, you know, any more than most Americans know anything about, you know, much about uh, neo-Nazi stuff in America. You know, we just get what we glean through the radar. And in fact, I'll show you an interview with uh, a lot of younger Russians coming up here. They're clearly, they're naive about whatever is happening. And uh, it isn't the point of the higher-ups to, uh, you know, let everybody know. However, they do encourage church worship, obviously. And the question is, is how deeply infiltrated by this ideology are the Russian Orthodox? They've just broken with the Ukrainians, their Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is very sad. And I know that people who are especially the people who have become Orthodox in the last uh, 20, 30 years, or more recently, are very conflicted about this, and for good reason. And, you know, I suppose, I mean, I wonder, you know, what's happening in churches here, in, uh, well, not here in Georgia, but in America, that are, and, and by the way, the Georgian Orthodox Church here is firmly not Russian Orthodox, so there's no, they, they, they tend to, or, or Orthodox churches tend to be on the nationalistic side. So, uh, but, but in other words, what's happening is they have made a, a neo, uh, let's call it neo-fascist rather than, than uh, Nazi, uh, kind of, you know, this is why, what Putin is doing is not coming from random thought. He really believes that he needs to restore the empire, the old empire, which unfortunately makes me feel, and I'm not alone, feel a bit squeamish about sitting here in Georgia because we were part of that empire only for 200 years, including the Soviet period. But still, I mean, Georgia's history is much older than 200 years. So, anyway, it's, uh, what you find is that people who hold one form of fascist ideology are fighting people who hold another form of it. But that's not all that's fighting. If you look at all those people fighting in Kiev, Kiev, uh, fighting in, uh, you know, all those different regions, there's that small group in the corner. Everybody else is just a Ukrainian fighting for survival in life. You know, maybe there's other uh, groups. And, of course, there, there, are, there is a message about the Americans helping them. And what that's all about, uh, the training them, I don't know. I don't know what we were thinking. This is stuff that needs to be looked at. But, like I say, you know, did those people, the Azov Battalion, do terrible things? Absolutely. Why were we there? Don't know. Does that have anything to do with uh, what's going on now? Yeah, it, it certainly does. And the fact that Putin would use them also and could easily point to them and have actual facts and photos and, and videos to prove this is what all Ukrainians are like, the rest of the 43 million. And we need to get them back, but first we have to denazify. And denazify seems to mean... Break them completely. Will will Putin even allow the Western Ukrainians who are more nationalistic to have their own country when it's done? I don't know. Uh, I, it's not looking good. There's already bombs falling on the eastern, uh, western part of the country. So I don't know. But if you meet people who say they're all fascists or they're mostly fascist or that we're behind the fascist or blah, 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 
No, no. And two people you need to listen to, you need to watch Freedom Alternative discussing Duganism. Believe me, this is psychedelic stuff. And actually, Lauren Southern, who I expected to go more with the uh, many of the other anti-woke folks, actually has kind of been taking a an even more uh, balanced position. I mean, some of her stuff in the past I've been a little leery of, quite frankly. But she's taken a more balanced position. I think she had to step back because she realized she was getting into hot water with what she was doing. But she just uh, had an interview with Mark Millerman, who's been translating Dugan, which, by the way, you cannot find Dugan's work on uh, Amazon. And I've wanted to read what's called the fourth political theory. But in fact, over at the STOA, they interviewed Dugan. And I just found this and haven't watched it yet. And I'm wondering if, like, do you think he's on your side? Because <laughs> he ain't. And in fact, one of the things that Freedom Alternative points out, I wish I knew his name, but free is maybe if you know his name, let me know so I can actually give the guy a name instead of a moniker or an avatar. But one of the things he points out, and this is why it's so important that you watch, it's like an hour and a half video, is that he points out that Dugan changes his message for the West and says something very different in Russian. And since most people don't read Russian, don't speak Russian, they're missing the fact that this is what Dugan thinks should happen to these mongrel Ukrainians. Let me play you a little bit from Freedom Alternative. So Dugin explicitly says that for the purpose of the Polish-Romanian political project, the advocates of Duginism must do everything in their power to avoid looking like the hand of Moscow, even though they are and they will be. Also notice the willingness to be purposely confusing when Dugin says that, quote, their image of themselves as defender of Europe and Christianity should be reoriented towards defense from liberalism, cultural Marxism, the ideology of political correctness, oligarchic capitalism, plutocracy, and the forces of global hegemony. Now, this comes from a man who is funded by ol oligarchic capitalism, has a cultural Marxist view of sexuality, hangs around circles of plutocrats for most of the time, and aims to build Russian-centric global hegemony. <laughs> I mean, you can't get more hypocritical than that, but... <laughs> but then again, Dugin doesn't care if he is hypocritical. As he says in his book, it all depends on the current political project. In other words, hypocrisy is acceptable, or in a more traditional sense, the ends justify the means. He probably learned that as part of the National Bolshevik Party. <laughs> but hey, at least he is willing to acknowledge several realities about Poland, Romania and the Baltics. I mean, wanna know what Dugin thinks it should be done about Ukrainians? By the way, here's Dugin in a Google Hangout. Я думаю, убивать, убивать и убивать больше разговоров никаких не должно быть. Как профессор, я так считаю. But just in case he might be misrepresented, Dugin made sure to clarify his outburst on Facebook. Here's Dugin on Facebook saying, quote, Ukraine needs to be cleansed of idiots. A genocide of cretins suggests itself. Cretins who are virulent, closed for the voice of Logos, deadly, and in addition to this, extremely stupid. I don't believe that these are Ukrainians. Ukrainians are a fine Slavic people, but these are some race of bastards that emerged from the sewage. A genocide suggests itself, and the cleansing of a country is needed. I mean, this is the guy who for a while was the official policy advisor at the Kremlin, and still retains to this day a disproportionate amount of influence. Yet for some reason, I am the extremist whenever I mention the not-so-covert and the glaringly obvious danger of Russian aggression. Meanwhile, back in the West, we're being told a lot about that all, now what's happening is all the inflation is the fault of the war. Which is really odd because 
you know, a month ago it wasn't. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about just one thing, oil production. Now, for my source on this, I'm going to give you a guy who's actually eco left wing, but very sensibly so, if such a thing is possible. And I'm going to let you, I'm not going to uh, show you a clip from his video, but I'm going to put a link here where he breaks down what's happening with the oil and what's going on. He, t you know, uh, I disagree with him at many points, but one thing is absolutely sure that he makes this, the, the point very, very clear. Uh, in America, for instance, we're going to be suffering a great deal of inflation. A great deal of inflation. Worse inflation than at any time in our history. We're already there. But one group who is not going to suffer from this whatsoever are the oil companies. Because they know how to manipulate the market. You'll notice their prices went up the second they heard it. They didn't wait for anything to change. They did it. And then their prices come down well after whatever emergency is over. They've always done this. So let's not say that the oil, we're protecting oil companies. And this is the point this guy makes, uh, is that how much is already being done? What's not being said? Uh, anyway, it's typical. <laughs> you know, I don't have any great love for oil companies. Um, not that we have any other means and, and, uh, you know, maybe we need to make some, you know, there's a lot here, but one thing that's clear is that the oil crisis isn't quite the crisis they're making it out to be. It's, you know, someone's taking advantage of it. They will see very good profits, uh, at their next board meeting. Will Russia continue on to Europe? This is a great source of fear and propaganda. And my thought is, I don't think anybody knows. But there's a good chance they want all of the satellite countries back as well. Which is why one thing I really felt in the Czech Republic, and I feel from people I keep in touch with or watch their videos from Poland, is... Are we next? And if that happens, we've got some serious issues. What does it mean if Ukraine is in the EU? Will anybody fight? Will anybody help them? Because it's it, this is really complex. Worst case scenario? Well, there are a lot of worst case scenarios. But here's one to watch for. China invades, take, finally takes Taiwan. You see that happening. You know, it's time to get over postmodern irony and laughing at all this stuff. This is, there's no more LOL situation going on here. You know, that was the point of my WTF, my short WTF Putin video, is that we're living in this hyper ironic, Postmodern in the sociological sense, you know, where everything is brought, we're, we're still living in that zone. We can't believe we're like, uh, uh, you know, uh, frogs who don't know when to get out of the water. We're still swimming in it. It's getting really almost to the boiling point and we're still swimming in it. We're still, you know, it, it's still, uh, you know, American Idol. It's still, uh, you know, uh, booty shaking and twerking. And the mood in Eastern Europe is really different than the mood anywhere, particularly in America. America has no clue. America has been totally safe throughout most of this. I mean, even uh, September 11th, you know, it was like 3,000 people died. I wonder how many people have died in, in Ukraine by now. You know, I wonder how many people will die by the time it's over. Do you realize that Ukraine has suffered more than any other country on Earth? Certainly in the last... Uh, 150, maybe 200 years. You know, in the 20th century alone, they lost n half their population by the year 1955 through wars and famines and uh, purges. You know, we comfortable Americans and Westerners, you know, uh, don't have any idea what that means.
not 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 a shred of an idea. So, um, yeah, where where who can we trust in this time? I'll tell you if you're getting your news from particularly these sources, CNN. Do not. Rachel Maddow does not know anything on you know MBC, uh, MSNBC, and CNN. You should avoid like the plague. Because they're just propaganda arms. Uh, should you get your news from the New York Times? Sometimes. But you need to back it up with facts. Sometimes the New York Times has some good stuff. Uh, sometimes, they, and this was particularly true uh, during the Trump years, they, are just, uh, they were just being a mouthpiece for the woke uh, revolution, which doesn't look like it's going to happen now. Yeah, Washington Post, it's owned by Jeff Bezos. What do you think he thinks? Fox News, uh, there's a little bit. Of, I actually trust Tucker Carlson now and then. Sometimes he gets on his high horse. I'm going, okay, he's doing propaganda. Uh, the actual news reporting, sometimes that's pretty good. It's, it's, but their commentators, no, not really. Um, I'm just trying to be fair here, you know. I'm not trying to say you should do what you should do, but you need to find good sources. Here are some of the people that have talked about the Ukrainian situation, either in the past or in the present, that I trust. Uh, one good source of news is Unheard, which is a uh, digital magazine. You can subscribe for free or you can uh, uh, pay a little bit more money and subscribe in a special way. But they have a very good roster of mostly English folks, mostly British folks, who have taken a very sensible position on things. They are getting closer than a lot of the mainstream media. And I think they are better than a lot of the kind of startup private sites uh, that people have done for to get to get the news out their own way because they actually have people like Dominic Sandbrook who write for them. And Dom Dominic Sandbrook is a legitimate historian. In a sense, what we need during this time is people who have serious ears to the ground historically. And again, there's a great deal of naivete going around now. So check out Unheard, and that's U-N-H-E-R-D, as in decouple yourself from the herd. And and uh, they've got a lot of interesting stuff. You don't have to agree with it, but I think they're basically honest. And what they've done so far on the Russian uh, issue, they're not reporting as much as they are uh, discussing. And I think they have a good, good point. Uh, Another person is Constantine Kisson, who has a uh, podcast and a video channel called Trigonometry. Not Trigonometry, but Trigonometry. And he uh, is a comedian who just, uh, basically started feeling the wrath of uh, the, uh, the extreme censoriousness of the, the, you know, the folks who like to cancel people. And he just decided, I have to do something about this. So he, along with another guy, Francis Foster, started this trigonometry channel, which I recommend. There's a lot of good conversation and dialogue going there. But most importantly, he is Russian. His wife is Ukrainian. He, he's been, he is British. He speaks with a British accent. He's been in Britain for quite a while, but he grew up in Russia. And he's got Ukrainian family members as well. And I think he's uh, also uh, Jewish. But the point is, when he talks, he talks with a bit of authority. Because he gets immediately the naivete of the West on this stuff. So I saw a Twitter thread that you had posted where you were sort of explaining how you felt the anti-establishment or alternative voices and media have basically got this Russia question wrong. Tell us about that. Well, uh, the thread did c concentrate somewhat on that, but the thread also concentrated on how the mainstream media have got this wrong as well. Uh, and uh, my my central argument is, I think, uh, there are different reasons for, for the mainstream getting it wrong versus the, the old media. I think the old media got it wrong because we're all stuck in this culture war bubble where 
we interpret everything through the prism of the other things we already believe. And so it's been kind of strange and also humbling in a way for me to watch because a lot of people that I'd normally agree with uh, are really not very clued up on this particular issue and are just frankly embarrassing themselves over the last couple of weeks. And the reason they're doing that is not because they're bad people or because they're stupid or because of anything like that. The reason they're doing this is it fits what they already believe and what they already believe mainly is the mainstream media is constantly lying to them, which it is. The mainstream media is not trustworthy, which it's not. Uh, the, the politicians that talk to us are not telling us the truth, which they're not. And therefore, anything the media say, anything the politicians say is automatically untrue. Now, as a heuristic, this doesn't work very well because it, it prevents you from seeing the truth from the lies. So that's the alt media. The mainstream media have got this wrong because, uh, I mean, I think they're probably just lazy. Uh, Vladimir Putin, you talk about who should we listen and trust to on this. Vladimir Putin did an hour speech on Russian television, which was translated into every major language in the world a few days ago, in which he told you exactly what was going to happen. Exactly. And when you say people are shocked and surprised, I don't understand why, because all you need to do is spend an hour listening to what he said, and you would know that what I predicted would happen, which is there would be an invasion, that it wouldn't stop in the east of Ukraine. Uh, and we can talk more about what he said in that speech. But basically, it's just laziness. I think no one in, in Western media has an hour to sit down and listen to a politician talk. I've been spending my time, you know, I've been reading Solzhenitsyn since the mid-1970s. I've gone on and read all the works of Dostoevsky, and I've kept up with Russian politics, the Cold War. I had a Russian friend in New York, and uh, I remember the weekend of the, uh, the, uh, the coup. We were walking around, and he came up to me and said, yeah, seems like the Russian mafia was putting vodka on the streets to get there. The people all up in arms. He'd talked to some KGB <laughs> types. It was just crazy times. But I've kept up with Russian stuff ever since. I am not Russian. I am, though, part Ukrainian, part Polish. Gives me a little, I don't know, slight bit of cred. Um, Tim, now, now, I would say that uh, Kissin would have considered himself to be kind of a center leftist guy. Uh, also, a little bit more left, but also centrist, is Timmy, Timothy Gartnash, who writes for The Guardian. Now, some of you may hear Guardian go like, oh my God, Burn, we can't trust anything from The Guardian. Well, I don't believe everything he writes, but he was an eyewitness to most of the fall of the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Empire uh, back in 89, 90, 91. Uh, he, he was particularly involved with uh, Poland, West Germany, Czech Republic. He was there for many of those crucial moments. I don't agree with him all the time. I think he's a little extreme on Poland and Hungary, but he understands the history of this region. What's clear, and I'm sure Roy will agree with this, is that medium to long term, Putin is achieving the exact opposite of everything that he says he wants to achieve. He says Russians and Ukrainians are one people, one nation. Um, this is the final act which ensures, as Daniel said, that all Ukrainians, including Russian-speaking Ukrainians, regard Ukraine as one different nation. It is the final act in that process of nation building that Daniel talked about. You know, in recent history, 1991, 2004-05, Orange Revolution, 2014, Euromaidan, and then this. Uh, he says he wants to push back NATO's military presence in Eastern Europe to pre-1997. He's achieving the precise opposite. For the first time, NATO is getting serious about the defense of its eastern frontier militarily. He thought he could divide, Roy touched on this, and I think Daniel did too, he thought he could divide Europe and America. He thought the West was weak, decadent, postmodern, vegetarian, all of that. He has created a unity of the West such as we have not seen since the Cold War, and even then it was almost rockier. Um, many of you will know the crisis theory of European integration, that the European integration advances through crises, going back to Jean Monnet. Not always true, by the way. 
It's not automatic. But this one is having that effect, that transformative effect on Europe, although I think it's really important to stress what Daniel said. 2014, this war has been going on for eight years in the east of Ukraine. And looking back, 2014 is the turning point at which Europe failed to turn. If we had done the military support, which Daniel is talking about, sanctions of a kind we're only doing now, reduced our energy dependence in Europe such that the swift sanctions could now be applied to the whole Russian economy and not just to selected banks because we're worried about paying for our gas so that Russia is still getting a billion euros a day in payments for gas and oil and woken up to Putin's possible intentions, we would be in a different place. But one person I haven't heard from is Robert D. Kaplan, who is a more center-right kind of character. Uh, Jewish, where Garten is English, Jewish-American Kaplan. One of his major influences is Machiavelli's The Prince. And he tends to look at uh, politics through a pragmatic lens. Again, I don't agree with him on many things, but he wrote a book called The Revenge of Geography. And of course, one of the biggest things he points to is That zone that runs through Russia, Ukraine, into Poland, Germany, down to the top of France, is one long, unbroken plain. And there are mountains, uh, you know, the Alps are on one side, containing it, the Carpathians, the, uh, the Tatras are all there. But essentially, there's this big open zone. And geography has not been kind to that zone when it comes to human settlement, because... They're all in each other's face. They don't know where the borders are. They don't have natural boundaries. And I think what he has said has been very, very important. So I'm waiting to hear his thoughts on this recent crisis. I haven't heard them yet, but here's what he has said in the past. Putin is you is playing this well, or at least trying to. He's using the fear of ISIS on one hand in West, Western Europe, but on the other, he's trying to move ahead with a second Nord Stream pipeline, which will bring natural gas directly from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Western Europe, to, to Germany, the Low Countries, and, and, and France. Th- that way, bypassing Eastern Europe and having a direct link to, in order to solidify ties between Russia and Western Europe. So this is where energy geography intersects with terrorism in the Middle East to bind together Western Europe and, Na- and Russia while Eastern Europe is exposed and looking solely to the U.S. And I would also tune into Dominic Sandbrook and Tom Holland's uh, podcast, The Rest is History. And I'll put a link to that below. Because again, these guys are historians. They're not rushing to judgment. They're not trying to take sides. You know, yeah, of course, it's terrible what's going on in Ukraine. But they're trying to get the, the whole picture. What's motivating people here? And they recently did a series of uh, four episodes about the rise of Putin which you really should listen to. And again, my thought is get off whatever high horse you're on where you think you know what's going on and dig into history. And you need to do that soon, but not hysterically. Don't, it's not a conspiracy theory. And when people start giving me, yeah, but it all started with you know the IMF or the, the WEF or whatever, I'm sitting there going like, okay, right. You, you you spent no time looking at history. You just found these theories lying around. And they seem to explain things. And the other name for conspiracy theory is propaganda. So I'm going to finally start to end this.
Here are some things to remember. And some of these things seem almost ludicrously obvious. And yet, propaganda makes them not so. So, things to remember. This is really happening. This is not a false flag attack. This is not uh, disinformation. There really is a war going on. Cities are being destroyed. Thousands are dying. Millions are fleeing, including Russians. We've had over 25,000 Russians show up here to get away from Russia. And we've had thousands of Ukrainians show up here as refugees. And then we've got the Georgians. Hmm. Where could this lead? Um, but this really is happening. Thing to remember, number one. Because there are people who think somehow this is all being manipulated by, for our benefit. Number two, the West, particularly the Americans, don't really understand what's going on and need to be humble and walk carefully. And if you're an American or a Canadian or something and you write something about, yeah, but I really know what's going on, you can consider yourself dissed at that point. Just for even writing it, I won't even bother to uh, reply. If you say, but this is what's really going on, and you give me some sort of conspiracy theory, I will not respond to that. If you get even more uh, confrontatory, I'll probably delete it, because I don't care. Here's the next thing to remember. <clears throat> the Russians are indeed still human. And to my Russian subscribers, who I know exist... Вас предали. Очнитесь, откройте глаза, не сидите сложа руки, перестаньте просто постить ваши черные квадраты в Инстаграме и предпринимайте конкретные шаги, чтобы остановить этот ад. Я знаю, некоторые из вас уже предпринимают их, но нужно больше, нужно намного больше. Прямо сейчас ваш президент крадет будущее не только у жителей моей страны, но и у вас. Ваше молчание не простят вам не только украинцы, на которых летят бомбы и ракеты от вашего имени но и ваши дети. Вам не простят его семьи русских солдат, которые сейчас умирают по прихоти вашего ебаного Путина, пишущего за вас вашу историю. Время действовать. All is lost. Надо идти. Already fragile balance between two of the countries today. Have called home in my past. Have been demolished. In the negotiation competence of Russia has been sent back. 3,000 years. I have nothing to say besides it. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to be what I am. Ashamed to have brought the culture that brought me up to a large scale audience as it is. 550 million views is no longer a metric of accomplishment for me. It is a metric of lost cause. I have no illusion of this being an insignificant achievement. Although... I play it off as such every time I can. I no longer feel proud. I no longer feel happy to have put all that effort in. All this time. All is lost. Many are against Putin and many just don't know what's going on. You can say, yeah, but they must know. You underestimate the effect of Russian propaganda. They are confused about the severity of the situation. They are being fed bucket loads, truckloads of propaganda. Relatively few are in favor of the war. Younger Russians under 30 are particularly naive and are optimistic that this will all work out. Check out this video uh, from uh, a channel I've been watching for about a year now called Ellie from Russia. It's just this very personable Russian girl with flaming red hair who goes around and uh, explores different parts of Russia, and it looks really like a fascinating place. She humanizes them for us. And, and yeah, don't give me the, she's just doing that as propaganda. I can tell when a person's a propagandist or not. She's not. She generally has, I think, a, a, a good heart. 
And listen to the people she interviews. They're all kind of confused. They're young. They're in their 20s, it looks like most of them. They don't know. They, they all hope it'll just work out. I hate to tell them that it's probably not just going to work out. It could get a lot worse. And as for me, PayPal stopped working in Russia and now I don't know what to do with my business. It's the main uh, income for me. I have a Russian speaking club and now Russia is switched off from SWIFT. PayPal doesn't work and I don't know how to continue my business. So basically now we are completely cut off from the rest of the world. International companies stop working here or fire their Russian employees. People are losing their income. And I know that there are people now in a much worse situation with bigger problems. But still, it's not easy for Russians as well. We never wanted this. На самом деле я уже и успокоилась, плюс моя, мое, мое окружение, с которым я сейчас общаюсь, он довольно лояльное и старается поди... мы стараемся поддерживать друг друга. Я за мир во всем мире, и чтобы не было никаких ссор, войн и специальных операций. Касаемо всей ситуации в мире, в принципе, грустно, конечно, грустно, удручающе, что вот так вот все это происходит, но я надеюсь, что в ближайшее время все наладится. Ну, в целом, если абстрагироваться от тревожности из-за новостей, то все хорошо, потому что весна, не знаю, весной хочется больше делать обычно, чем, чем зимой. Меня вся эта ситуация очень беспокоит, но я уверена, что мы с этим совсем справимся. Сейчас у меня, наверное, так да, где-то стадия принятия, более как-то уже, менее эмоционально, наверное, на это реагирую, но... Как бы суть-то вопроса не поменялась, военные действия происходят, ну как бы идут дальше, люди дальше погибают с обеих сторон, и э, это, конечно, очень расстраивает, э, очень расстраивает и то, что, э, наверное, то направление, э, в котором сейчас э, может двигаться страна, но кажется <laughs> грустным, вот, поэтому есть какой-то страх и в первую очередь непонимание, что будет дальше, неопределенность. Как ты думаешь, что нас ждет в России? Нас ждут перемены. Жизнь, к сожалению, не будет больше прежней, потому что нам придется как-то выживать пока что без привычных вещей. То есть там без ЭПЛП, без магазинов некоторых. Вот. Но я уверена, что мы так, справимся. Кстати, Сложно сказать, я не какой-то там политик. Но я надеюсь, что как-то все образуется, и э, очень не хочется, конечно, терять связь с э, Европой, с э, другими странами, потому что э, мы все-таки как-то очень уже привыкли к этому. Я верю только в светлое будущее, и у меня по жизни есть одна фраза, которая помогает мне всегда двигаться дальше. Я, что бы ни произошло, всегда говорю все, что не делается, все к лучшему, и надеюсь, в скором времени все наладится и будет только светлое будущее. Я думаю, что нас ждет счастливое светлое будущее, и только мы способны его творить. Возможно, кто-то посмотрит это видео и скажет потом, что я Ванга. Вернется Советский Союз на самом-то деле. Будет объединение, как мне кажется, трех братских народов. Это Россия, Беларусь и Украина. И просто возьмут, конечно, может быть, не особо приятные вещи Советского Союза, но заживем мы по-любому по-другому. Я считаю, что... Будет восстановление определенных э, сельскохозяйственных э, организаций, потому что по-другому никак. Ну, как бы голод будет, да, то есть, ну, и за счет этого всего люди начнут действовать. И я думаю, мы просто отстыкуемся от Запада и начнем жить так, как нам и давно полагалось жить. То есть не быть зависимыми от Евросоюза и вообще от Запада, а просто начать показывать свои клыки и кто мы есть на самом деле. North America is still really deeply divided. This is also true. Everything is being fit into pre-existing propaganda categories, which is very dangerous. 
See, we were on, there's just so much tension in America. I was in the Czech Republic and a friend of mine said, well, at least this is bringing the Europeans together. Even the Poles and the Hungarians who are kind of apart and have their own ways of doing things. And I thought, it's not bringing any Americans together. For one thing, the Americans simply, apart from television footage, which they don't understand what they're looking at, they can't actually empathize because they think, we, Americans think, we are the center of the world. So what's going on there is, you know, it's not, it doesn't involve us. Whereas, like I, I pointed out, how many Ukrainians are in America? Over a million. How many Ukrainians in Canada? How many Ukrainians do you know? You probably know some. You know, they get around. And that doesn't even count people like me who are part Ukrainian. Eastern Europeans have every right to be afraid. And when I was in Prague, I came across this march the first night and then a much larger march a little later on where there was 80,000 people. And uh, one of the YouTubers I follow from Poland, who's usually very funny, just gave a very unfunny uh, discussion of what's going on there. I'll play a little bit of her uh, discussion of it. Uh, it's uh, of what's going on at the border and what the Poles are experiencing in this. Um, a lot of like international students are just headed to their home countries, whereas the Ukrainians don't have homes anymore, and it's so scary. Like just yesterday, my dad spoke to a Ukrainian lady and her daughter, and he was like, you know, so what? What are your plans? Are you staying in, in Krakow or what? And I think someone asked like would you like to come back home at some point? And she was like, oh no, our village is burned. Like, the home isn't there anymore. And a friend has also told me, and I think she's probably watching so high, um, a friend has told me that, that someone she knows is hosting like a Ukrainian family and Ukrainian kids uh, somewhere at the countryside, like at the Polish village. And one day a fire alarm went off in the village. And the kids were just terrified. They were so scared. It's been less than two weeks and you already have a generation that has been traumatized for life. There's a lot of um, volunteers and it's so hard to get anywhere because there's just too many people that want to do something. There's just so many people willing to help that's really hard to get into all sorts of like organizations or just places to help. And on the other hand, because it all happened so suddenly and because it's it's just, you know, a million people came to the country in a matter of like over a week, it's we don't have the infrastructure to like manage everything yet. We don't even have the system yet. So it's such a mess and and there is no time to come up with that system because more people keep coming. And I think something that that bugs me and that people don't really understand in what's happening is that it's it's like everywhere. You you see people that are tired with suitcases and you're like, oh, did they just escape bombing? You see someone crying on the tram or you see shop clerks and you hear that they have an accent and they're glued to their phones all the time and you're like, oh, are they reading about their, you know, hometown being bombed? And you see children speaking Ukrainian and you're like, oh, do they have family left, you know? And you see men on uh, train stations with a backpack and you can't help but think like, are they on their way there to fight? And one of my earliest memories was when I was, I think, four or maybe five 
and I was in Warsaw and I was in this park enjoying myself and there was this huge line of green trucks and I got a bit scared because I was like what's that and my mom told me like oh they're on their way to Yugoslavia you know they're bringing all the like humanitarian aid there I think that that's also like my first war-related memory that I have and the next one was when I was like eight or nine and we went to a concert I remember it was on a stadium it was like people playing trumpets and stuff and at the, at the very end of the concert they they did like they fired the cannon as a way to celebrate and I remember seeing my grandma like all curled up and and her hands over her ears because because it brought back the bombs that she experienced during the uh, the Second World War when she was still a kid. I don't think people will grasp how familiar Eastern Europeans are with the concept of war and I don't think people realize the generational trauma of the Second World War especially in Eastern Europe and sort of what it has awakened in us now. You know every single family like every single Polish person I know has a ton of like heartbreaking stories from that time and we just grow up hearing them all the time you know. My grandpa was like eight when he had to swim through a river escaping like Russian troops because they burned down his house. Imagine experiencing that at eight. And my grandma on the other hand uh, had to collect like the, the coal that the trains dropped on their way. She would like go on the tracks and collect that coal and she was actually caught by a German policeman and like it's a miracle that, that he let her go because she was stealing. And my other grandma couldn't even speak about her experience, her like war experience. 70, like over 70 years later, she never wanted to talk about it. And, and here's the thing, and how many Americans are Polish? <laughs> Suddenly it's like a lot higher of a number. You see what I'm saying? This isn't just going to affect a few Ukrainians, and there are more than a few Ukrainians, but there's a lot of Poles. And what's going to happen with, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Armenia. You see, all of these things are tossed up into the air right now. We're waiting to see what happens in Ukraine. One wrong step here, like a no-fly zone. This is one place where Zelensky, who I really do think is being heroic, and how can he be both corrupt and heroic? Because we are not all one kind of person. You know, if a person tells a lie, they're not a liar. The, although we all are in some ways liars, we lie. But a person who's a habitual liar, we can say that person's a liar. You don't believe what they're saying. But a person who tells a lie, a person who is corrupt doesn't, yeah, like Oscar Schindler, Schindler's List. Very corrupt kind of guy. And yet, look what he did that was good. This is what I think is happening with Zelensky. Does that mean he's going to rule perfectly after... Uh, this is over? No. I mean, look at Rudy Giuliani. A lot of people thought he was way too tough on New York. There's a lot of criticism of him. But then during September 11th, he had a really heroic moment, much more so than the president of the United States at the time. did. And then later, he started to look like a fool. This is how people are. Think about yourself. Are you one person all the time? Do you not do things that are contradictory? Do you not do things you are ashamed of later? And yet, sometimes can you not pull out of yourself something noble? But his, his call for a no-fly zone, absolutely wrong. Why? Because all we have to do is shoot down one Russian plane. And we'll all be in desperate territory. Сьогодні відбувся саміт НАТО. Слабкий саміт, розгублений саміт. Саміт, на якому видно, що не всі вважають боротьбу за свободу для Європи метою номер один. Дев'ять днів ми бачимо жорстку війну. 
руйнують наші міста, обстрілюють наших людей, наших дітей, житлові квартали, церкви, школи, знищують все, що забезпечує нормальне життя, людське життя, і хочуть це продовжувати, знаючи, що нові удари і жертви неминучі НАТО свідомо ухвалили рішення не закривати небо над Україною. 2019 and everything before it, everything since the Second World War are definitely over, period. Rock and roll is not going to save us. You know, the hippie rebellion won't save us. Psychedelics aren't going to do us any good. Uh, you know, the Internet has not turned out to be such a great thing. It has divided us. Um, you know, all of our hopes for a perfect future. This is the problem with the woke folks. They believe in utopia. Maybe one good thing that is happening out of this is that people will wake up from these utopian dreams. Or when this is all over, maybe the utopian dreams will come back with a vengeance. As, as I said uh, before my new Dark Age video, I think that the real terror will come when the people who believe in saving the planet do so to the detriment of the humans on the planet. Finally, most importantly, we must keep the suffering of the Ukrainian people front and center. They have probably suffered more than anyone else in history. And that's saying quite a bit. But trust me, when you start walking through Poland, before you even get to Ukraine, it's like the ground bleeds everywhere you go. And when you get to Ukraine, you're talking about the charnel house of Europe. You know, maybe China has suffered more. But then again, they have a much bigger population. You know, we can talk about the Jews. And they have quite, suffered quite a bit. Uh, but the, the Ukrainians are right up there. You know, they have suffered tremendously in history. You know, that's why their anthem starts off, we have not perished yet. They're trying to do something to keep their hope alive as an independent people. And we must watch out for being sucked into revenge cycles. Revenge cycles are one of the darkest parts of humanity where you do something to me so I have to do something to you because then I, you have to do something to me because I did something to you. And this goes back into primitive times. There was a, a video I watched uh, as a kid of, uh, called Dead Birds and it was about uh, these tribes in New Guinea who would just fight each other over and over and over. And they would fight until one person was killed, then they would, the war would be over. And, but then the tribe that lost somebody had to go and kill someone from the other tribe, either by stealth or have another war to get revenge. And we are being pulled into digital revenge cycles, which then have real world trauma and death and and misery behind them don't fall into a revenge cycle learn you know when you talk keep the suffering of the real humans in mind and that includes not only the ukrainians but the russians and uh let's hope it doesn't include you in the end Есть ли у вас возможность э, следить за местными, локальными СМИ, то есть украинскими, либо же российскими, и с того, что они говорят, какова причина ввода войск Российской Федерации на территорию Украины? Ну да, конечно, в последнее время очень много слежу за новостями, как и российскими, так и украинскими. Ну и, конечно, совершенно диаметрально противоположной точки зрения, что является частью информационной борьбы, развязанной двумя странами. Согласно российской точки зрения, Россия вторглась на территорию... 
вошла на территорию Украины для того, чтобы защитить граждан ДНР и ЛНР и самих же украинцев от группки националистов. Да? Ну а украинская точка зрения, которая совпадает с, с точки зрения всего цивилизованного мира, что российская армия вторглась в 6 часов утра на территорию Украины и сейчас пытается уничтожить украинскую государственность. Ой, ну СМИ говорят разные вещи, особенно учитывая, что э, есть СМИ российские, которые оправдывают это вторжение да, какими-то там совершенно фантастическими э, этими причинами, якобы там какие-то неонацисты там разгуливают по Украине, обязательно их нужно уничтожать, да. Но есть другие люди. На самом деле это довольно загадочная вещь, да, и многие люди гадают, что же случилось, почему именно сейчас. And there won't be any room for the order of the soul. I didn't make those up. Well, was this serious enough for you? Thanks for listening. Do not be a propagandist. Do not think that people who are on different sides of different fences are somehow inhuman. That's what's going on in Russia right now with Their, their army attacking. And, and the good news is their soldiers don't seem to have their heart in it. And I hope that is uh, something that stops them from winning. Um, if you pray, this is a good time to do so. And challenge what you believe, no matter where you're coming from. Don't go with the current. Swim against it. That's the anadromous life. We will meet again. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.